You know, one of the things I was most proud of when we launched the church 10 years ago is that we as a church body in our very first year gave away more money into the Harrisburg community and into church plants around the nation and in ministries around the world. We gave away more money in our first year than the average church plant even usually takes in in revenue. Let me say that again. Our first year we gave away more than what the average church plant even takes in. And one of the reasons that I think that we're able to do that is I had made a decision that went against all conventional logic when it comes to planning a new church ourselves. And that is the very second series that we ever did was on finances. I talked about how to get out of debt, how to stay out of debt, how to save up for emergencies, how to invest in your future, and then how to be radically, radically generous with your money. And, you know, in a a society where here in America, the average Christian only gives 2% of their income back to their church, we're actually all the way up to about 7% is what we were actually giving back to our church. And that allowed us as a church to be then very, very generous with what we were doing. Now, a couple years later then, in 2013, I redid the series again. This time we called it Strap. The first uh, series, by the way, was called Mind Your Own Business. And it's by far the the most downloaded series that we've ever had. Even to this day, every year, people just continue to download that particular series, The Mind Your Own Business. Uh, 2013, I redid it. We called it Strapped. And again, we saw people's individual financial lives just change tremendously. And as a church, we were able to continue to be generous as well. And so over the past seven years, what I've been able to do is basically not have to preach a full series. I've just been doing maybe one or two money sermons per year as a part of other series. And in the back of my mind, I was like, I don't need to do a full series because we're still a very, very generous church. Now, as I shared with you back in the last week of 2019, when we had our breakfast, for various reasons in 2019, our giving really went down. And so that led me to, to doing a little deeper dive into, okay, what is, what is going on? Where are we at? Because again, my mind said, oh, we're still really generous and we're still up at like that 7% range or so. And here's what I discovered. I took the Dauphin County average uh, household income, and I actually subtracted $10,000 off of that because I thought, you know, it's exponential. We're a middle class to lower middle class as far as, you know, we don't have a lot of doctors or lawyers or anything like that here at our church. So, you know, we we may be a little even below the Dauphin County uh, national or um, um, uh, average. And so I took that number, then the amount of giving households that we have here, and I did all the math on it. And what I found shocked me, because we're actually down to 3% is what we're at. And if you don't factor in the $10,000 buffer that I gave us, we're actually below the national average as a church in our giving. And so what that meant for me is, oh, whoops. In my mind, I thought we were one place, but we're actually at another place. And I knew I needed to do another full-blown series on finances. Now, let me share this with you at, at the very beginning. I mentioned to you there that last week of 2019 that I had to actually stop taking some paychecks uh, during 2019 just because that's how bad the finances had gotten for us. Uh, By the way, I'm caught back up, so that's good to go. But I wanted to let you know I'm not doing this series because I need a paycheck, all right? What I'll share with you throughout the whole series is the plan that Lisa and I have been on for the past 20 years, the plan that I'm going to teach you has allowed us to do very, very well from a financial standpoint. So don't worry about us, we're fine, okay? But here's what this is. This isn't a financial issue for me, this is a pride issue for me. And here's why I say that. I wanna be the best pastor for you that I can possibly be. And Jesus made it very, very clear that the number one indicator of how you are doing spiritually will have to be with how you're doing with the resources that he's entrusted to you. This is part of the reason that Jesus in two-thirds of his stories, talked about money and possessions. In fact, Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven and hell combined. He knew this was going to be a big, big thing for you. So look at what he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Again, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, how you spend the money, the resources that God has given to you says a whole lot about how you are doing spiritually. So by default, what that means is the worse you're handling God's money, the worse it means I'm doing as your pastor. Because again, Jesus says this is going to be the number one indicator of how you are doing spiritually. 
And if we as a church are doing actually worse than the national average, that means I'm doing a horrible job as your pastor at helping you to do the number one thing, much less all the other things. And so we have got to talk about this. It would almost be pastoral malpractice if I didn't address this issue with you. And so with all that said, I want to apologize to you because for the past you know, seven years since I last did this series, Lisa and I have continued to follow the plan, and we've done very well. In fact, I'll share with you some of the, the numbers uh, of how we've done as, as the series has gone on, or as it goes on. We've done very well, but apparently we've left you behind. And I want to, again, apologize for that, and I want to make it up to you by just sharing with you, again, these principles that we have found in God's Word that we've been following for now 20 years, and it's allowed us to have financial independence. So to start today, here's, here's the question I want to ask you. How many of you have ever made a stupid decision with money? Hopefully every hand is up, if not the rest of you are liars, all right? We've, we've all done that. I mean, I'll put two hands up for that one. We've all made dumb decisions. How many of you, here's another question. How many of you would say, you know what, if I just had a little more money, then life would be so much easier. If I just had, you know, just a little more money, life, life would be so much easier. Yeah, again, a lot of hands going up for that. The reality is this, though. When it comes to money, most people, including many of you, feel that you're in financial slavery, a financial bondage that you're in. You feel stressed out when it comes to money and resources. You're constantly worried about it. And so what I want to do over the next couple of weeks is talk to you about how do you get out of debt? How do you stay out of debt? How do you save up for emergencies that come up? How do you invest for your future? And then again, most importantly, how do you become radically generous once God begins to bless you? Here's the problem. Many of you are going, what would a pastor know about that? I, I mean, if, if I want marriage advice, I go to a marriage counselor. If you know, I, I want relational advice, that's you know, a relationship uh, type of person. If, if I want you know, to know about good cooking, I go to a cook. I don't come to a pastor for those things. So wouldn't I go to like a financial advisor for these things? Why would, why would a pastor do this? So I've shared this with you in the past. I am a complete idiot when it comes to most things in life. But there's two things I've done well with. Marriage, relationships, and then finances. From a very early age, God just uh, gave me the abilities to, to know how to, how to handle uh, finances and, and do math and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, God so blessed us after Lisa and I first got married that we did really well for like a three-year period financially. We had a very high income. But unfortunately, you know what I did? I did what most of the world did or does. The more I made, the more I did what? I spent, right. And so we spent it all. And then God called me to be a pastor. In my very first year as a pastor, $22,000. So we went from a six-figure year income to $22,000. That's a pretty big drop in income. And all of a sudden I realized, you know what? We have got to figure out this financial thing. And so I had always had the, the intellectual wisdom of what to do, but I wasn't necessarily applying it. And so it was 20 years ago, because actually February here is 20 years I've been a pastor now. 20 years ago, I decided, you know what, we're going to get our financial house in order, and we're going to start following a good plan. And that's the plan I'm going to share with you over the next couple weeks, and it's allowed us to do a lot of great things and to not have to worry and be stressed out when all of a sudden the church can't you know, provide a, a paycheck. It hasn't been a big deal. Inconvenience, yes, but not a, not a big deal. Okay, And that's where I want to get you at as well, is to get to a place where you don't have to stress out about it anymore. So it's not only that I have the experience with it, but God's Word has a lot of great things to say about how to handle the finances and resources that He's given you. But the problem is we oftentimes listen to what our society says about money rather than what God says. And what you're finding is that when you do that, it leads to problems. Not just financial problems, but it leads to emotional problems and health problems because you're worried and stressed out about money. And it leads to relational problems as well. If you have financial issues in your household, it, it's strained relationship then with your spouse, or with your kids, with your grandkids, with your siblings. And most of all, it strains our relationship with God 
as well. And so I want to encourage you, be here all four of the weeks that I'm going to be speaking in this series. And no matter how crazy the principles are, try it. Just try it. I mean, what do you have to lose, right? Because many of you are already stressed out about finances as it is. So try something different. So here's our key verse for the entire series. In fact, I want to encourage you to actually memorize this verse and, and really use it as a mantra for your life. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. The poor are ruled by the rich, and those who borrow are what? Those who borrow are what? Slaves of moneylenders. Let's actually say that one out loud together. The whole verse, ready? The poor are ruled by the rich, and those who borrow are slaves of moneylenders. The reality is, many Americans, including many of you, are slaves to money. Now, you don't walk around saying, hey, everybody, look at me. I'm a slave to money. But the reality is, that's where, again, many of you are at. If you've ever said something like this, you know what, I would love to get married, but I just can't afford it. Guess what? You're a slave to money. If you've ever said, you know what, we would like to have kids or have more kids or, you know, take a nice vacation, but we can't afford it, then guess what? You are a slave to money. If you have ever gotten to the end of the month and you go, whoa, there is too much month left at the end of my money, then you are a slave to money. If you have ever gotten to the place where you said, you know what, we would love to buy a house, but we just can't afford it, so we're just going to have to continue to rent. You are a slave to money. If you've ever said, you know what, I'd love to go on a missions trip like Gilbert did you do to, down to Haiti or what you just did in Kenya, but man, I just can't afford it. But man, I'd love to go serve kids in a foreign country like that, but I can barely afford to take care of my own kids. Then you are a slave to money. If you're not tithing, you're a slave to money. Tithe just simply means 10% of your income. 10% of whatever your gross income is, is supposed to come back to your local church. If you're not doing that, you're a slave to money. Because basically what you're saying is, instead of advancing God's kingdom, it's more important that I advance my own kingdom. And unfortunately, again, this is where most American Christians are at. Most American Christians don't give 10%. The average, again, is 2%. And at one point, we as exponential were all the way up to 7%, which is phenomenal. But now, again, according to the, the math that I was showing, if we even deduct that 10,000 off, we're at about 3% as exponential. But if we don't deduct that 10% off, we're actually below 2%. And again, this is the number one indicator of how you're doing spiritually is are you advancing God's kingdom with the resources that he's given? Are you living with a closed hand or are you living with an open hand? Because here's the deal. When you live with a closed hand, God says that's all you're ever going to get because you're holding tight. But if you learn to live with an open hand, say, God, it's all yours anyway. It's all yours. You take whatever it is that you want to get. And he says at minimum 10% of it. At the very minimum, 10%. But then what happens is, as God starts to see you living with hands wide open, he says, ah, there's somebody I can trust. And I can bless them with more. And that's Lisa and I's story. We've never had a, a big income other than those three years I was self-employed and blew it all. It's always been a very small income. But we've lived with hands wide open and said, God, we're not even just going to give 10%. We're going to give more than the 10%. Because we can't outgive you. And God has continued to bless and bless and bless and bless. But again, the reality is that is not the story of most Americans. Let me share with you some shocking statistics. If you're taking notes, the first one is this. The average American spends 136% of their salary each and every year. In other words, most Americans are spending more than what they make. Now, in Dolphin County, the average income per household is $48,000. That means most people here in the Harrisburg area are actually spending $65,000 per year. Now, we whine and complain about our government spending way more than what they take in. Guess what? We're doing the exact same thing. We spend more than what we make. Number two. The average American has credit card debt of $5,839 per adult in the household. Now, this is the third time that I've done this series here at Exponential in the past 10 years. 
each and every time that number has actually increased. When I did this series back in 2010, it was like $3,000 some dollars per person in the household. Now it's up to $5,839. That's a whole lot of Starbucks and getting your nails done and shoes and power tools and putting emergency expenses on credit cards. We got to stop doing that. Number three, the average 21-year-old is in debt $12,000, and that number will grow to $78,000 by the time they are 28. Now, a lot of that is college bills. But you know what? Colleges don't teach good financial principles. How to, how to actually handle your finances in a good way. And then many 20-some-year-olds are very undisciplined with their money. And so they get this massive amount of debt that they just don't even feel like they can get out of. And that's why we're seeing more and more and more you know, 25-year-olds and, and 30-year-olds that are still living at home with mom and dad because they've just amassed this, uh, all this debt. And even if they do get married, one or both then of the, the partners, they, they come together and they've got all this debt. No wonder then there's so much strain on their relationship. It's not just this financial pressure, but that financial pressure then puts a, a strain on their, their married life. And then they start to have kids and that's more money and then that starts to put pressure on, on the kids as well. Number four, 78% of U.S. households live paycheck to paycheck. Now, when I did this series back in 2013, that number was 61%. 2013, 61% were living paycheck to paycheck. Today, 78% of all households are living paycheck to paycheck. What that means is this. If we have 60 people that are here at Exponential today, that means 48 of you, if you lost your job tomorrow, couldn't make your car payment, couldn't pay your rent, couldn't do your mortgage. You couldn't pay for just basically the necessities of life. Because again, you're living paycheck to paycheck. That is a big, big problem. But our society says, no, it's not a problem because you can just put it on the credit card. You can just take out more and more loans. You can just continue to rack up more and more debt and you'll be okay. Our society has taught us that debt is normal, that car payments are normal, that mortgages are normal, that having a credit card balance, that that's normal, that having student loans is normal. We've been taught that fighting over money is normal, that divorcing over money is normal. That lying in bed at night worrying about money is normal. But listen, if you're here today and you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you and I have not called to be normal. We're not called to be normal. If you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, why would you want to be normal? If that's what society says is normal, why would you want to do that? And so none of us have to settle for bad advice. You know, things like, Oh, well, you'll just always have a car payment. The Greek word for that is baloney. <laughs> you don't have to have a car payment. Lisa and I, just two years ago, we bought another new, or new car to us. It isn't new. It had like 20-some thousand miles on it. It's the eighth consecutive car that we've paid cash for. We have not had a car payment in many, 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 many years. Car payments are not normal. Debt is not normal. Stop being normal. What was our key verse? What our key verse say? Say it to me. Read it again. What's it say? Right. If you have debt, you are a slave to the money lender. And we are to be slaves to no one but Jesus. The Bible gives us a better way. Now before I get to that, let me give you two temptations that you're always going to face. Here it is on your notes. Number one, I'll always be tempted to serve money. You're always going to be tempted to serve money. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says this, you cannot be what? You cannot be the slave of two masters. 
You will like one more than the other, or you'll be loyal to one, or uh, more loyal to one than the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I've always been so fascinated by this verse. Because Jesus doesn't say you can't serve both God and the devil. He doesn't say you can serve both God and, and power or God and popularity. He doesn't say you can serve, you know, but you can't serve both God and your own sexual desires. He doesn't say any of those things. He says you can't serve both God and money. Why? Because again, Jesus knew the number one competitor that he would have for your heart and for your life is your money. Now I know a lot of you are saying, you know what? I would never serve money. I, I'm not a a slave to it. But here's what I'd argue. If you have ever bought something that you didn't need with money that you don't have to impress people that you don't even know, you're a slave to money. You've been serving money. If you've ever bought something to make yourself feel important or special or to make yourself feel happy, then guess what? You have served money. If you're not tithing, you are serving money. If you've ever neglected your family members because you needed to work more hours so that you could have more money because after all, they deserve a better lifestyle, you are serving money. Number two, I will always be tempted to love money. So not only are you going to be tempted to, to serve money, you're going to be tempted to love money. Paul said this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people want money so much that they have given up their faith and caused themselves a lot of pain. So you're not to serve money, you're not to love money. Notice here that, that Paul said to Timothy that it isn't money that's the root of all kinds of evil. He said it's the what? It's the, the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. I've shared this with you before. Money is just like fire. Fire is neutral. You can use fire to heat up your house or burn down your house. It's completely up to you. Fire in and of itself isn't good or bad. It's how do you use it. And money is the exact same way. It's not good or bad. It's how are you using it. You know, a lot of people, they're like, well, I don't love money. But yet, if you're consumed with more and more and more and more, i got to get more stuff. That I need to make more and more and more and more money. And then guess what? You love it. If you get jealous of others that have more money, or you're critical of those that have a lot of money, guess what? That means you love money. You're going, but I, I don't have a lot, so that must mean that I, I don't love it. Well, it doesn't matter how much you have. It's your attitude towards it. It's the same way that, you know, just because somebody's rich doesn't mean that they love money. I mean, some people have a lot of money, but they don't love it. They have money, they use money, they leverage money, but they don't love money. They're just really good at handling their, their finances. Again, money is neutral. It's how you use it that matters. Many people think, well, if I just had more money, then all my problems would be resolved. But the reality is, the more money you have, usually the more responsibilities you have, the, the more you need to work, the more stress that there is, the more that's demanded of you. Some people say, well, you know, if, if I just had more money, then I wouldn't be in debt. That's not true either. Because again, the general rule of thumb is this. The more money you make, the more money you spend. Did you know that even the average millionaire is living paycheck to paycheck? And when I say millionaire, I mean like that's what they make, not their net worth. I'm, I'm talking people that make a lot of money, they spend a lot of money. And they go in debt as well. But guess what? The more you make, the more stress there is because now your debts are even bigger. And the pressure to keep that high paying job is even more. So if you don't learn how to handle your debt when you have just a little bit of money, you're not going to learn how to handle it when you have a lot of money either. Again, the, the truth is most Americans spend way more than what they make. A lot of people say, well, if I just had more money, then I would be more generous. Again, I wish I could tell you that the statistics said something different, but it's not the case. In fact, the smaller your income is, the more likely you are to give a higher percentage. 
Once you get more and more money, if you haven't learned how to be generous, then you're not going to suddenly wake up and become a generous person. You see, money is neutral. And what you do with it determines whether you're a slave of it or not, whether you love it or not, whether you serve it or not. Money just makes you more of who you already are. So if you're poor and you're a jerk, guess what? If you suddenly get money, you're going to be a rich jerk. In fact, we have a name for that. They're called snobs, right? Again, money just makes you more of who you are. So if you're poor and you're very generous, then when you become rich, you'll also be very generous as well. Now, I know some of you are going, okay, Gilbert, thanks for the lesson here, but I don't love money. Well, let me ask you a question. Are you sure about that? Are you 100% sure of that? Because at the very beginning of the message, I asked you a question. I said, how many of you would say, if I just had some more money, life would be so much easier? And almost every single one of your hands went up. Here's what Scripture says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. Those who love money will never have enough. Those who love wealth will never be satisfied with their income. Now I want you to look at the person next to you and go, I think he got you. Go ahead and say it. Go ahead. This is your chance to be the Holy Spirit for somebody else. And then turn to the person on the other side of him and say, yeah, he got you too. <laughs> Look, I know this is a hard message today because I'm giving you just some, some shocking stats and, and I'm being a little hard on you. But again, I want you to see this is what our society has said is normal. And we don't want to be normal any longer. Why is this such a problem? Well, let's go back to the verse that I started with today. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your, what? There your heart will be also. What Jesus is basically saying is this. No one here today has money problems. Let me say that again. There is no one here today that has money problems. What we do have is some heart problems. We have some spiritual problems. We have some spending problems. We have some lifestyle problems. We don't have money problems. You know, our mouths a lot of times say, oh, I want more and more and more and more of Jesus. But the reality is of how you're living your life, when we look at your heart and your wallet and your credit card statement, it indicates that no, you actually want money and you want stuff more than what you want Jesus. And that's a dangerous, dangerous place to be. Because again, money is the number one indicator of how you are doing spiritually. And so if we're just consumed with more, we're always after more, and we're not being generous, we're not tithing, we're not doing what God says to do, then spiritually we are in a very, very dangerous place. So my prayer is that over these next couple weeks, you'll get serious about starting to handle money God's way, not the world's way. And I'm going to give you very practical things. People have said to me in the past when I've done this series, they're like, this is the most pragmatic series that you do. It'll be biblically based, but I mean, we are going to get into a lot of just you sitting and, and uh, crunching some numbers and, and very practical, do this and do this and do this, do this. I mean, very, very practical stuff. But it's from Scripture, and I've got a 20-year track record that it works. And the same freedom that we have, I want you to have as well. I don't want you to waste any more time and any more days when it comes to your finances. So I'll get to that in the future weeks, but for today I want to give you just a couple perspectives that I want you to chew on all week long. Three different things that I want you to just keep reminding yourself all week long, over and over and over and over again. The first one is this, I don't serve money, I serve God. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is not optional. Jesus needs to be your top priority. We are not to be a slave of money. We are to be a slave to God. We're not to be a lover of money. We are to be a lover of God. He needs to have first place. So I don't serve money. I serve God. Number two, as I serve God, money serves me. And the question for that then would be, well, 
How is that? How is it that money now starts to serve me? Well, money, the more you have of it, does give you more options. Let me give you an illustration. I just got back from being over in Kenya. I flew to Kenya. Why? Because I had more money to be able to do that. I could have taken a boat <laughs> and then a car ride. <laughs> it would have been cheaper, but because I had more money, I was able to fly. And guess what? Because I invested even a little bit more money, I didn't even take a connecting flight anywhere. I actually had a direct flight right into Nairobi, Kenya. Money gives you more options of things to do. Money buys you time. And the more time you have, the more you can invest in advancing God's kingdom instead of, you know, other things that you may have to do. So, like, one other example, like for Lisa and I, and th there's multiple reasons that we do this, but um, we always hire somebody, like, to take care of our lawn. One reason is I'm allergic to grass and all that kind of stuff, so that would just be miserable, right? You don't want me up here every Sunday just, like, <laughs> snotting and, and everything. But we've, we've always done that, and... and you know, when it comes to fixing stuff, actually, George will tell you, every time something at the house happens, I always call George because George is connected. I'll say, George, who's your plumber? George, who's your construction guy? George, who's your electrician? Right? Because instead of me trying to figure all those things out and taking the time, and, you know, I probably couldn't do it anyway, but, uh, you know, hire somebody. It gives them a, a living and allows me to take that time and, and do something else. So the, the better you get with your money, the, the more options that you have that now you can hire somebody to, to mow your lawn or, or to clean your house or, you know, to do whatever it is that you need to have done. Do the oil in your car. Make the repairs in your home. Money gives options. Here's another example. Many of you are like, man, we'd, we'd love to go on a vacation. Okay, there's many options for vacation, isn't there? One option, if you don't have a lot of money, is you can say, all right, we're going to drive to grandma's house and we're going to sleep on her sofa. <laughs> That's one option. That could be a vacation. But if you have a little more money, if you've been a good steward of God's resources and he's blessing you, then you have a little bit more. You can go, we don't have to drive to grandma's house. I mean, we love grandma and stuff, but let's drive to the beach or let's drive to a cabin in the mountains and let's rent something, you know, get a, in a resort or someplace like that. That's a little bit more money. If you have even more money, guess what? The options become even more. Now you're like, hey, we can fly to Hawaii. We can fly to Europe. We can take like a whole month if we want to, to go away. So that, that's, that's what it'll do. Money starts to serve you and allow you to do things. And again, including advancing the kingdom of God that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Basically, at that point then, you're in control of the money and money isn't in control of you. Number three, money allows me to advance God's kingdom. When we're not a slave to money, we're able to bless others in ways that we just simply can't when we have no financial margin. If you see a need... You're able to just say, you know what, I'm going to give and help with that need. And you don't even have to really stop to think about it. You're just able to, to do it. Why? Because God has blessed you, and now you're able to be a blessing to others. If you see an initiative that we're doing here at Exponential or something that an organization is doing there in the Harrisburg area, you're able to go, wow, I want to partner with that. I believe in that. I want to give in order to make sure that that happens so that Men and women and boys and girls can come into a relationship with Jesus and grow in a relationship with Jesus. And again, except for that three-year period when I was self-employed, Lisa and I have never really had a, a really high income. But yet what we've done is we have followed God's plan for many years now, and it's given us freedoms that we never thought that we'd ever be able to have. You know, the travel that we get to do. Most of you know that like every other year we fly out west and we spend like three weeks out west just traveling around, seeing different things. We love that. We love to travel. As far as our giving is concerned, you know, we don't just stop at the 10%. We give more and more and more and more and more. Why? Because it's such a blessing to be able to, to, to just help others and advance God's kingdom and, and just be generous. We love that. Through the years, we've seen friends in need, and we've been able to say, you know what, I know a bank won't give you a loan, but we'll, we'll give you a loan for that. And again, you know, <laughs> a couple months ago, I wasn't even getting a paycheck. 
Most people, if you you weren't getting a paycheck, you'd freak out about that, most of you. But we didn't have to freak out. Why? Because we've been following this plan. God is blessed. And now we're a lot more relaxed. Don't have to stress about it nearly as much. And you know, my my goal, and I've shared this in the past, and because of some things of shifting money around, it's adjusted a little bit. But my goal is that by the age of 55 at the latest, which is only, what, seven, eight years away, something like that, um, that by that point, I'll be able to tell you guys at Exponential, I don't need a paycheck anymore. That the remaining 10, 15, 20 years of my ministry is completely on the house. It's all free because God has blessed us that much that we just simply don't need to be taking an income from the church anymore. So I'll share with you over the next couple of weeks, again, the plan that we've been using for 20 years to do that. And I'm telling you right now, some of you are going to think that it's crazy some of the things that we've done. But it's possible. With hard work and discipline, it's possible. And it's well worth it because, again, you don't have to stress about your finances any longer. But here's what I've shared with you in the past. Things which are easy to do are also what? Who remembers? Easy not to do. Things which are easy to do are also easy not to do. So I'm not going to share with you anything that's not from God's word, and I'm not going to share with you anything that's really hard to do, but it's also going to be easy for you not to do it. So you're just going to have to make the determination. Am I going to follow God's word and his plan for how to handle finances and resources or not? It's up to you. Personally, I like not being stressed about it. I remember a couple years ago, my father-in-law, while he was still alive, he was living down in Florida, and he said, so what are the gas prices up your way? And I was like, I don't know. He's like, what do you mean you don't know? You got to, like, drive around town, find that. I was like, seriously, I have no, and I can say that honestly to you guys here today, I have no idea what the gas prices are right now. I'm guessing it's somewhere between, like, 99 cents and $5. I, <laughs> am I in the, what is it? What, what is it? Two something? Okay. Seriously, I had no, I have no idea. Why? Because I need gas, so I just drive in and <laughs> fill up. I don't even look at the, the thing. And that's the place where I want you to get that when it comes to like just stuff that you don't even have to think about it anymore, that it can just happen for you. So how many of you say, all right, uh, you whet my appetite. I'm, I'm interested in, in what you're doing. I don't know that I trust you yet, but I am interested in what you're going to say. All right. How many of you would say, you know what, being completely 100% debt-free would be a really cool thing? Would you like to be completely debt-free? Yeah, that'd be an awesome thing. How many of you would say, you know what, I'd love to have more so that I can invest more in God's kingdom? Would that be a cool thing? Yeah. All right. Let me give you a little bit of a preview for next week. Close with this. Romans 13, 8. Apostle Paul says this. Pay your debts as they come due. However, one debt that you can never finish paying is the debt of love that you owe each other. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for this day and for this opportunity to to come together and to look at a very touchy subject uh, when it comes to the church. A lot of people don't want to think about money in church. They want to talk about money in church, but Jesus, since it is the number one indicator of how we're doing spiritually, it is something that we need to uh, talk about. And Lord, again, I, I apologize to you. I apologize to the people here in this congregation Uh, that I haven't talked about it enough, Uh, that while Lisa and I continued to follow the plan, we unintentionally left some people behind. And again, not, not just that doesn't bother me from a financial perspective as much as that spiritually that means that people have been hurt. And that grieves me, Lord. And so forgive me of that and just help me to, over these next couple weeks, just share your word in a clear and concise way um, to just give, give the plan that, that, that we followed according to your word. And Lord, in the same ways that you have blessed us as we've lived with hands wide open, I pray that you would do the same thing and that you would even supernaturally just make up for the years that have been lost. And Lord, we, we don't want money for ourselves but we, we want to realize that we have been blessed so we, we can be a blessing to other people. And so, Lord, help us all just to, to have that attitude of 
Lord, I'm living with hands wide open. I just want to give it all away. If that's what you call it, I'm just going to give it all away because I want people to come to know you, Jesus, and I want people to grow in a relationship with you. And Lord, the, the promise is that we can't outgive you. But Lord, help us to continue to have the right heart and the right attitude, the right mindset, that we don't give in order to get. We give in order to bless. So, Lord, I just pray that all this week would we continue to reflect on these, these thoughts that I've shared today. That we're not to be lovers of money. We're not to be slaves of money. We're to be lovers of you and we're to be a slave of you. And that as we serve you and as we love you, now money will begin to serve us and then we can be a blessing to other people. Change us, Lord. Help us not to be normal any longer. And I pray this in your precious name, the great name of Jesus, amen.